She just isn't plan B. That's the biggest thing I think for all of us as Catholics that we need to know. Jesus isn't coming just to set us back because we fell out of the garden. Jesus is the garden. It's made quite clear, you know, throughout the scripture, throughout everything that Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the sinner. He's come to give us himself, you know, happy falls are necessary, sin that one for us, so great a redeemer. And so we have something much better than we had in the beginning, and that's the person of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he came to break us free from the fact that we're captured, right? He came to save us from that so yes it's always the plan but what wasn't part of the plan is sin so exactly what he did when he got here that's probably not exactly what was planned you know Um, not until satan rebelled and tried to destroy us right um so the 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 book that we've been reading about stewardship renewal um it it used this comparison to d-day right um do we think that the people of France, you know, on um, December 7th, were sitting there thinking, oh, what's going on in the news today? We had some people land on the beach to fight the Nazis, but uh, what's the weather like tomorrow, right? That's not what it was. They were like, they came to save us and to break us free from these forces, right? And so, so, so that's the moment of the incarnation. The moment of the nativity is God's invasion into this world to destroy the darkness. Right to destroy Satan, um, to free us from the shackles of sin and death. Right, and and he always meant to be with us, just like you said. He wants to be with us. That's why he's doing it. Right, um, but but why did he come in the particular way that he did? Um, why did he do everything that he did? Why did he die on the cross for us to destroy death and to destroy sin? Right. And it's come that they have life and might have it more abundant. Mm-hmm. A light pouring into the darkness. That's why Jesus had to die, because he's the author of life. And he takes that life and pours it into a place of death. Just like in our own life, you know, brokenness. He goes into that place and pours his healing love, his healing spirit. Mm-hmm. And so he overcomes death by pouring life into it. You know, touching a fire to something that, that is now on fire because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Why does that, that mean something to us? Because there's certainly death in our life. Not merely we were not just reminded of that when we go to the cemetery, we're reminded of that when we close our eyes or through tears or through brokenness, through pain, through agony, any of those things are moments of death. And those are the places, those are the concrete places where Jesus wants to pour his grace into our hearts. Because it's, it's hard to ignore or be insensitive to those areas of brokenness Unless we're trying to think of death merely as something that we drive by on the mm-hmm. highway or when we're inconvenienced mm-hmm. when a funeral is professing by. <laughs> if that's all death is to us, then I think we're woefully out of touch with what's going on in our own life. Every single one of us is going to confront death at some point. Um, every single one of us falls into sin. Every single one of us has this struggle. And if we were left to our own devices, first off, we don't come to the right answers, right? Um, We just don't. And and we we fall into these traps of thinking that this will make me happy, this will make me happy. The only thing that remains of us after death, if we aren't um, united to Christ, is the memory of us on this earth. But because Christ died on the cross, he conquered sin and he conquered death and he showed us that that is not the end because remember three days later he rose he rose from the dead and he was fully human which means each of us also fully human can rise right if we follow him um so we all go through death but then we come out the other side if we follow jesus christ that's why it matters is because it means death is not the end in the funeral mass, the, the preface is beautiful. Um, it, <laughs> you, you do the first preface at funerals, it's beautiful. It says, um, life is changed, not ended. Um, it's just like every time I say that preface, I just want to shout that to the people who are here. It's like, this is not the end, <laughs> so get ready, but don't despair, you know, because Christ has saved us. And he showed us that it's not the end. It's just, it's just different. Is Jesus relevant? You know, is his life, is his death, is his resurrection relevant to you? 
well, frankly, it's the only thing that makes everything else in our life make sense. You know, if we take a bunch of letters and jumble them up, read them backwards, it, it just doesn't work. We're made in the image and likeness of God, and that's the only way that we can see and function as we are. If I put the wrong type of gas in the car, it won't work. <laughs> if our lives are trying to be understood or lived through without this, pressing ourselves into this image of God, we're just simply moving in the wrong direction. And so, yes, Jesus is relevant because it's the, either the creator of the universe, it's the, it's the only way we can understand the poetry of creation, the goodness of creation, who God is, who we are. It's, it's, it's the only way, it's not just the, an option. It's the, it's the only way. What is it? Uh, in one of St. Paul's letters, uh, he says that thing um, like, uh, if Christ has not died and risen, then <laughs> like, what the heck is the point of all this, right? Obviously, that's a paraphrase, right? Um, but I, like, that's just, I think that's such an important scripture. And I really should have it memorized since I think it's so important. But, but it's, it's like exactly what you're saying, you know, if, if this isn't relevant, if God isn't relevant, then what, what's the point? No, you're not just a background character. You're not just a part of a group. There's two elements of salvation. And uh, I got to be careful here because I might slip into seminary theology mode if I'm not. Um, but there's two ways in which we are saved. We are saved with our community, right? So that's why it matters um, when we sin. That's one of the reasons we go to confession is because we're saved with our community. We're saved with our church. We're saved through the church, right? So there is this, I'm a part of the community aspect to that. But at the same time, it's deeply and intimately personal. First off, each person was created by God, not humanity in general, but Father Luke, you were created by God, right? You are loved by God, you, separately from me, just as much, right? Um, infinitely, so to speak. But he doesn't love, oh, yes, we love the priest of Blessed Sacrament as the priest. No, he loves Father Luke. He loves Father Matt. He loves Samantha. He loves Erica. He loves Becky. He loves every single person, and he knows them by name, right? Um, is it Isaiah? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Is that Isaiah? I think it's Isaiah. <laughs> um, like, God knows us intimately, and he knows us better than we know ourselves. How could he not save us individually? Like, he cares about every single breath we take. Jesus Christ in the gospel says he's counted every single hair on our heads. For me, it took a lot less time than for Father Luke, right? But, but he cares that much. Um, he wants us with him for eternity. And it's, it's incredibly important to remember that, um, that he cares about me. He cares about you. He cares about every single person, not as this group of persons, but he cares about you. And maybe it's hard to see that when we're suffering and struggling in our life. Um, we can ask those questions like, well, God, why are you letting this happen to me? Um, we don't have an answer to that other than he did this not for humanity in general, but for each of us in particular. Anyone that loves another person understands that there's not just some generic mold, that that's the furthest thing from love. It's, that's about use and reproduction, you know, just efficiency. Anyone who loves more than one person understands that, but that love isn't impersonal. In fact, it's the very opposite thing. You know, in our family, I've got two brothers, and, and I love them both uniquely. <laughs> I've got both of my parents. I love my mom and my dad. I love all of them, but they're all, every single one of those relationships is absolutely meaningful and fundamental. And it's the same way with our life of faith. It's the one who's living a vibrant life of faith. They're more unique. They're more alive. They're more full. They're more vibrant. They have more energy. They're more dynamic. Whereas you look at the our sinfulness and our brokenness, Hit the play button. It's the same thing over and over, regardless of who you are. That's where true darkness and concrete and whitewash, that's whitewash. There's no whitewashing in the statues of the saints. It's different in, the, in our life, you know, and that's a, a lie from the enemies that, that that individuality, you know, our, our particularness is lost in the life of love. It's the furthest thing from the truth.